Hey guys, well this is an off-axis guider. I want to do a little video here showing some of the uh, steps we have to go through in thinking about and planning an imaging session with an off-axis guider. This is the Celestron off-axis guider. It's well made. It's pretty heavy. Uh, probably not the best uh, off-axis guider for a uh, system like this refractor that I'm showing here where the weight of the off-axis guider would hang off the end of the focuser. There are lighter weight off-axis guiders for that. I intend to use this with my uh, Smith Cassegrain telescope. I bought this a couple of years ago with the intent of using it with the Smith Cassegrain just to reduce the mass moment of inertia that uh, that, that system has along with uh, its guide scope. In the case of the SCT that I have, I have a larger focal length and much heavier guide scope that's mounted on top of a larger diameter uh, Smith Cassegrain um, optical tube assembly, and so it creates a very high moment of inertia. Plenty of advantages uh, to moving to a an off-axis guider. The one disadvantage, unfortunately, is that you have a very limited field of view. You have a much bigger field of view with a guide scope. Therefore, it's more difficult to find a guide star for a high magnification uh, main scope such as a, uh, a 9.25 inch uh, SCT. That said, we're going to look at the effects of this and see what uh, how difficult it really is to find a guide star. Okay, so the essence of a, the off-axis guider is that one side is going to mount directly to the back end of your main imaging scope. In this case, it's an SCT. I'm showing the refractor I have here. This flat side of this prism goes toward the telescope so light comes in some of the light comes in hits this prism bounces up the axis here and this is where you would take your guide camera and by the way i bought this guide camera with the express intent of using it with the uh, with this off-axis guider notice how big the imaging sensor is that's what you're seeing there that's a, a fairly large sensor in this asi 174 uh, mini guide camera. I used to use an ASI 120 uh, mm has a much smaller sensor and it's it sees uh, about a fourth of the sky that this guide camera will see. Now the thing is there's a prism down here so the size of the prism dictates how much light actually gets up to this camera here but if you put the camera in and we'll talk about this in a bit. Notice that the long axis of the sensor should be aligned with the axis of the telescope. And you can look at the axis here. It, the long axis is along this line here. So you can adjust that, but you, in general, you want the long axis of the sensor to be aligned with the telescope. Now, once you get that set, there is, as we'll discuss in a bit, a critical height above the edge here that you want to set the guide camera to so that you can ensure good simultaneous focus with your guide camera and your imaging camera. Now, as I said, I'm going to be using this with the SCT, so I'm going to be putting in this SCT adapter. This side will thread onto the end of the SCT. This side mounts inside these three um, retaining screws here. Now, notice that the design of this has a groove, okay, right here. The, these three thumb screws don't contact a flat surface. They actually dig into this bare, into this uh, V groove machined into this part here, which is actually very good. We can set this thing on so it seats and just a, don't tighten it too tight. Just bring the screws in so that they engage inside that V and at this point, we can still rotate. So in other words, we'll be able to rotate the guide camera around the axis of the scope, which is something you're almost certainly going to have to do, particularly with a high magnification scope like an SCT. And when you get that set, when you find the guide star in the view of the guide camera here, you can set these screws. And so at that stage, the guide camera orientation relative to the axis of the telescope is set. And now, if you need to adjust the, the imaging camera, once again, you've got a fitting here. In this case, I've got the uh, external 42 M42 threads 
adapter mounted on the back end of this that will screw in directly into this 11 millimeter m42 spacer that comes with the zwo camera so this will plug into that we'll have the filter wheel and then the camera and then that will be the imaging setup for the sct so if after rotating the guide camera to find a guide star now you want to rotate your imaging camera to have the right orientation you just loosen up these screws you can rotate the imaging camera accordingly it's not going to fall out because the screws are still engaged in that v groove you get the camera oriented and now you have a nice mechanical connection from the scope back to the camera the imaging uh, the uh, guide camera is is uh, centered on a on a guide star perhaps there's only one guide star when you're talking about a high magnification system but this is kind of the plan of of uh, setting up the system for imaging with an an off-axis guider and a high magnification scope like an SCT. All right, so why consider an off-axis guider in the first place? Well, one of the main reasons is you have a large guide scope up here that's attached through the three thumb screws on each end. Uh, there is the possibility that uh, during the course of a night, there may be slight slips between the guide scope and these rings or the thumb screws causing a jump in uh, our, a, our deck and then creating a guiding correction to compensate for that jump when in fact it was just a minor little micro quake if you will a micro shift of positioning between the guide scope rings and the guide scope I've noticed something like this recently in guiding with my uh, refractor. I don't know that this is the cause. I'm just suspecting. But it is one of the things that can uh, undermine guiding, which is a slight shift in the field of view of the guide scope relative to the field of view of the imaging scope. And when there's a slight jump, uh, then the guiding software is going to try to compensate for that because it thinks the star moved, and it has in its field of view. So one of the th reasons of using off-axis guiding is to get rid of that possibility that the guide scope can shift. Another reason is, is that the image scale of your guide camera combined with this longer focal length guide scope is large relative to what you're viewing out of your main scope. So if you could take your guide camera and look through the main scope, you would have an image scale. In other words, you would be able to resolve the center of a star much more accurately than you can with your guide scope. And therefore, presumably, guiding would be more accurate. So there are some advantages. Now, what I'm showing here is the findings from an analysis I did some time back that was prompted by a YouTube video, I think, of a discussion where someone suggested that adding counterweights to the counterweight bar would reduce the mass moment of inertia of the imaging system and therefore make your guiding more effective. And I thought that sounded reasonable, so I wanted to take a look at the numbers on my own with my particular system, and that's what I did in a video, like I said, some time back. Now, what I found was that it was very limited. I could add one 17-pound counterweight which would allow me to shift the counterweights up in order to maintain balance of these two scopes on the other side of the right ascension axis. However, the best I could do is reduce the mass moment of inertia by about 16%. Now, it's not the, we often talk of the weight of the supported uh, scopes and counterweights on a mount, and that's the weight limit. It's not really the weight, it's the inertia. And inertia is the center of mass times the distance from the center of mass down to the rotational axis, in this case the right ascension axis, squared. So it's what mass are you putting on, that's the weight, and then what, that times its distance from the, the center of rotation squared that creates the demand on the torque motors, in this case about the right ascension axis. So the larger the mass moment of inertia is, the more difficult it is for your torque, for the right ascension torque motor to compensate for that and respond to guiding commands. The lower the mass moment of inertia, the more, in theory, the more responsive your system will be. 
And so when I went through this little analysis and said, well, the only thing I can do is add one 17 pound uh, counterweight, I'm only going to get a 16, 15, 16 percent uh, drop in the mass moment of inertia. That's not really worth it. Uh, that's, that's a minor, to my way of thinking at the time, it was a minor improvement. But then I went the next step and I said, well, what happens if I, if I put in an off-axis guider and then eliminated this scope altogether, combined with the rings and the little mounting hardware here. And by the way, this is a while this scope does not weigh as much as the main imaging scope, its distance, the center of mass of its distance from the right ascension axis squared is huge. And so if I could eliminate that mass and that inertia and replace it with a mass, not as much as that, but much closer to the right ascension axis, Here's what I found. I found that I could have a moment of inertia reduction of over 60%. That is a huge improvement, much more significant than just adding a counterweight. Now, it costs more. A counterweight, 17-pound counterweight at the time, cost about 80 bucks. The off-axis guider cost 220 bucks. But it was this analysis I did a couple of years ago that led me to buy the uh, off-axis guider. Now, I never used it. I've never installed it on the system. I've never tried it out. The guiding with the scope in this configuration that I had was adequate. Uh, it wasn't awesome. It was adequate. And I have never uh, tried it just because the fundamental question I had was how much difficulty in the setup and am I going to be able to find a guide star when I'm looking through this long focal length high magnification main scope versus in this wider angle uh, uh, guide scope. And that was a big concern to me. However, uh, as we've moved forward into recent days and I've bought the ASI 1600 along with the filter wheel, I am concerned that the weight that I'm adding on at the uh, prime focus with this replacing my camera system, the DSLR, which is not shown here, replacing the DSLR with the ASI camera and the filter wheel, I'm adding more weight and Already, the counterweights were at the bottom of the counterweight bar, so I was concerned about weight if for no other reason than I just wasn't going to be able to achieve balance without having to buy a counterweight. Now, that's caused me to think a little more seriously about using the off-axis guider to eliminate the weight of the guide scope and go ahead and get the benefit of this significant inertia reduction in the process. But the fundamental question remains, Will I be able to see guide stars through this very small field of view using the camera that I had, which at the time was the ASI 120mm? I'm pretty sure I can. It's challenging to be sure. In some cases, uh, very challenging. But for the most part, I'm pretty sure that for almost any target I want to image, I can uh, find a guide star that will uh, allow me to make use of the off-axis guider. In the previous video, I mentioned how I had gone through a uh, little process of measuring and then drawing all to at least a, a very simple degree, drawing all of the adapters and components that I have so that I could put together different systems, different imaging systems with and without an off-axis guider uh, on the two telescopes that I have. This is the imaging system as it's laid out with, an off with the Celestron off-axis guider with the camera that will be used with the uh, SCT that I was just showing you in the picture before. Now, here's what's happening. Light comes in through the telescope, which is over here to the left. Light comes in to, to the main imaging sensor down the main axis of the scope and hits the sensor. That's the sensor right there. What is happening from the with the off-axis guider is that a portion of that light comes in, hits this prism that's in the off-axis guider that I showed you a moment ago, reflects off and goes up the vertical axis to the imaging camera, which is this guy here, and its sensor. Now, here's the thing. We need to have both of these cameras in focus uh, for the same position, for the same relative position, mounting position on the telescope. So that's one of the challenges you have with an off-axis guiding system is you're no longer independent. I can't independently focus the guide camera and the imaging camera. Now they must be achieved focus under the same mechanical arrangement through the same scope. 
Now, what does that mean, achieving focus? Well, when the light comes in here, what we have to ensure is that the distance that the light travels from the center line of the off-axis guider body back to the imaging sensor, this distance right here, is the same as the distance traveled by the light reflecting off the prism up here to the guide camera sensor here. So we have to make sure that this length is equal to this length. And if we get close to that, or very close to that, then we will have both systems in focus. Now, in the case of the Celestron off-axis guider, this ring here, this green rectangle here, is a helical focuser. So the way I've drawn this green part, the Celestron off-axis guider, is to place the mid-length of travel for the helical focuser at the middle. In other words, I can have four millimeters of adjustment down and four millimeters of adjustment up. And this is the ASI 174 that I had mentioned before. And I've aligned, as I was discussing earlier, that the, the long length of the sensor is aligned with the direction that light travels down the tube. We'll come back to that in a minute of why that is the case. But by drawing things out in a more or less precise way, I can at least gain some confidence that I'm going to be able to achieve focus. So for example, if I go and measure the distance that the light is traveling from here back to the sensor, I get 65.75 millimeters. Now, let's try that again and look at the same distance, but now going up into the guide camera. So from the center of the mirror, 45 degree angled mirror up to the center of, or the face of the sensor, I'm getting again 65.75 millimeters. So I've drawn this to build in that equivalence in the two uh, paths that light is traveling. Now, here's the thing One, before we go out to do any imaging, we just need to ensure that we achieve the proper uh, measurement between the top edge of the Celestron off-axis guider and say this shoulder right here. So I need to achieve 18.45 millimeters. All I have to do is take my calipers, set the guide camera in place with the sensor proper, the long dimension of the sensor aligned with the axis of the scope, and then measure this distance. And as long as I'm getting close to 18 to 19 millimeters, I know that I'm gonna be pretty close to focus I'm going to see a star. I'm going to know there's a star there, if there's a star there. And I just need to rotate the guide camera around its axis, as I was showing you a moment ago. And then, once it's centered on a guide star, lock it, lock that uh, position down, and then make fine-tuning adjustments to the focus using the helical focuser in or out by a little bit. So with this arrangement, I know exactly where I need to set my guide camera so that I will be pretty close to being in focus along with the primary imaging camera. Okay, so here we are in Stellarium. Now let's zoom in on a familiar target. How about M51? And let's turn on the oculars to see what it would look like in our field of view for the main imaging camera through this scope. Notice that the orientation of the galaxy in this field of view with the long axis and short axis of the, of the camera sensor is oriented this way. This is a zero degree orientation. But if you look back at the picture I took with my DSLR some time back, this is the orientation with the camera mounted as if you would be holding it and then just attaching it to the telescope with the counterweight in the home position with the counterweight bar down, the scope up and pointed towards uh, the, the uh, North Star in effect so that the plane of the scope and the counterweight bar are vertical or normal to the ground. Now if we go back to Stellarium, we can adjust this orientation so that we get basically the same picture that we had. In other words, if we rotate the camera 90 degrees, then this would be the image we would get, which corresponds to how I would normally do imaging. But this just shows us what the image of the galaxy would be. What is the image as seen by the 
uh, guide, the guide camera through the off-axis guider. Well, we can get that information by going into these tools, go to the one your sensor, in this case it's the ASI 1600, and turn on the off-axis guider simulator. Now in this case I've pre-populated these uh, spots here with numbers that I've actually measured for the Celestron off-axis guider. So in this case, this is the distance from the center line of the view up to the bottom of the prism. And these numbers correspond to the size of the prism. Although in this case, the prism that I measure with the off-axis, the Celestron off-axis guider is about 12.5 to 13 millimeters, which is actually larger than the sensor in the ASI-174. The sensor in the ASI-174 is 11.3 millimeters in one direction and 7.1 millimeters in the other direction. And so I've made some adjust. Instead, I put the smaller of the values, the sensor in this case, as opposed to the prism, into these, uh, into these places rather than the size of the prism. Now, if I were using the ZWO all plastic skyer, its prism is eight millimeters by eight millimeters, which means in one case, I would not get to illuminate the entire sensor that I'm for the, for the ASI-174 that I can with the Celestron off-axis guider, uh, but I would be able to illuminate the uh, width of the, uh, the sensor as shown here. So in this case, I'm going with the smaller of the two dimensions, whether it's the prism or the sensor, and I'm adjusting the bottom correspondingly. This is not the distance from the center line to the bottom of the prism. Now it's the center line to the lower edge, if you will, of the uh, imaging sensor. So I've put these numbers in. Let's see what that looks like and see if we can find a guide star. Now, zooming out, you can see that the guide stars are visible only in this outer donut. And it turns out we don't have much to choose from, but it's over here. A second thing we can see is that with the guide, with this orientation of the camera and this and the off-axis guider placed with the uh, guide camera vertical, in other words, up on the top side, this is what we would see. So this is giving us a lot of good clues. First, it's telling us that, well, we only have one star to pick from. It's this guy here. The second thing is we can expect ahead of time that when we set this thing up in the daylight as we're assembling our system, preparing for a night of imaging, we need to have that guide camera turned all the way down to the other side in this particular case. Another thing that we're seeing here, and this gets back to why I was saying we need to uh, take care to orient the long dimension of the guide camera sensor so that it is parallel to the uh, light coming down the main axis of the optical tube. Because as we rotate the, uh, the off-axis guider around to bring that guide, the uh, one guide star we have a choice of into view, we're rotating normal in the, in the narrow axis of the sensor direction. That's the key thing. So now once we rotate this, as I showed you before, we can rotate the uh, guide camera to find the, well, in this case, the one guide star that's available to us. And then we can go back and rotate differentially. We've already, we've locked down the location of the orientation of the guide camera. We can go back and change the orientation of the main camera to get to the framing that we want to maintain for that. Okay, guys, well, that's all I had. I just wanted to share a few things that I've been playing around with with the off-axis guider, and uh, I'm looking forward much more so than in the past of actually making use of this piece of equipment I bought a couple years ago and hadn't touched since. Take care.